Thank you, Dean Miles, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I don't even play a legal historian on TV, so I don't want to pretend that what I'm going to be doing is legal history. I am an intellectual historian with an interest in law, and I hope that that interest will translate to something that, uh, find, that you find interesting. It's a special pleasure to be here, uh, always in Chicago. I didn't realize that this was Barack Obama's lectern, which uh, gives me a certain thrill because my book is an intellectual biography of the former president, and uh, I'm one of the few people who took him seriously as a thinker. It's a pleasure to be able to have accepted the invitation from my former student, Alison LaCroix, and those of you who are students of Professor LaCroix and find her demanding should realize that she's not demanding any more of you than she demanded of herself when she was a student. She was the most efficient graduate student I have ever taught and is now a very distinguished scholar. Today I want to talk about an issue in constitutional law that never gets old, the relation between the Constitution and the ideas of James Madison. When I first discussed this lecture with Alison LaCroix last year, I said to her that I thought I might address the issue of Madison and originalism. But after reading around for quite a bit, I've decided against that because I'm convinced that in the world of serious legal scholarship, the idea of originalism, whether it's 1.0, 2.0, or now 3.0, has been so thoroughly discredited by historians that there's very little left to say about it. Instead, I want to discuss a way of thinking about the purpose of the law and the purpose of government advanced by several thinkers in the late 18th century. It's a way of thinking that will strike some of you as odd and others of you as naive, particularly if you've come to law school from studying neoclassical economics or political science or evolutionary psychology or any field bewitched by the idea of rational choice. And I know some of you are here. I argue that the primary purpose of government, not only for Madison, but for other influential American constitution writers of the late 18th century, was not to protect individual rights or property or the freedom to do whatever a self-interested individual wants to do. The purpose of government, at least from the perspective of John Adams, James Wilson, and James Madison, was to advance the common good or the public interest. That, I will argue, is why Madison matters. Let's start with the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, drafted in 1780 by John Adams and still in force today. Adams had earlier provided the template for the first round of state constitutions in a little essay he wrote in the spring of 1776, Thoughts on Government. The framework he sketched there served as the model for the state constitutions in North Carolina, in New Jersey, and in Virginia and its influence rippled out from those three states. Adams followed the same template when he wrote the Constitution for Massachusetts. Butters had rejected the first attempt at a Constitution, but Madison's, or excuse me, Adams's version was uh, adopted and became law. Madison wrote to a friend that his Constitution was Locke, Sidney, Rousseau, and Dumas-Bly reduced to practice. Now, the presence of Rousseau in that list surprises a lot of people because Locke and Rousseau are often thought to have been uh, responsible for two very different traditions of thought and of government, one liberal and one not liberal, but perhaps communitarian or statist or even totalitarian, if only because Robespierre invoked it to justify the terror. Locke is said to have enshrined the rights cherished by Anglo-Americans ever since, and Rousseau is said to have enabled the use of the guillotine. So why did Adams think that both of them had inspired the Massachusetts Constitution? Well, the answer to that question involves reinterpreting Locke and Rousseau, as well as Sidney and de Mobley, and doing that is one of the challenges that I tried to meet in my book toward democracy. It's a complicated story, which is why the book is almost 900 pages long. And today I'm just going to sketch a few contours of my larger argument. I'm going to start with Rousseau because I think it's important to see that some of his ideas do lie behind the constitutional thinking of Adams, Wilson, and Madison. 
Since Rousseau savaged the idea of representation in the social contract, that claim will seem surprising to those of you who know Rousseau well. Rousseau pointed to the horribly corrupt system of elections in Britain, where a tiny fraction of the population chose for the House of Commons a few wealthy individuals who were said to represent them, even though in the rotten boroughs they had no contact with the people in those boroughs. Rousseau used that example to show the distance between conventional but flawed systems of representative government and his own radical ideal. Rousseau sought a form of government in which all citizens would internalize what he called the general will, his controversial and I think widely misunderstood concept of the enduring common good. Rousseau denigrated governments that merely added together the particular interests of particular individuals and particular groups. They privileged what he called the will of all, which he contrasted to the general will. In order to understand what Rousseau was driving at, it's necessary to read the social contact, contract alongside several of his other texts. In his book, Emile, which is a book about education that had a powerful impact on Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Rush, among many others, Rousseau explained what he meant. He traced the process whereby the, the protagonist, Emile, was taught by his tutor to internalize his duty. Through careful cultivation, Emile learned to love his duty and to will what he ought to will, not simply to follow his inclinations. Rousseau was drawing on a tradition that dates back to the ancient world when he argued that those who follow their animal instincts are slaves to their senses. Only those individuals who see beyond their shallow momentary impulses or their whims and act according to the dictates of reason are really free. Rousseau wrote in the social contract that sometimes people must be forced to be free, which sounds ominous. But he meant by it nothing more sinister than that they must be made to follow the law rather than permitted, let alone encouraged, to follow their personal preferences. In his words, they must learn to substitute justice for instinct and substitute the voice of duty for physical impulse. Rousseau laid out his argument in a string of texts. First in his 1755 article, Political Economy, in Diderot and D'Alembert's Encyclopedia. Then in the preface to his discourse on inequality, the draft of the social contract known as the Geneva Manuscript, and the constitutions that he was invited to write for Poland and for Corsica. In all of those texts, Rousseau made clear that he saw the value of a properly constituted representative democracy for any population larger than that of a small village. In that 1755 article, he described the general will as the source of the laws and the rule of what is just and unjust. In other words, a constitution. Most so-called republics, including that, that of his native Geneva, were, Rousseau argued, nothing other than oligarchies. They did not come any closer to what Rousseau was looking for than did the sham self-government in Britain. Rousseau argued that the people themselves must remain sovereign, not a monarch, not a landed aristocracy, not government officials. The people should elect what Rousseau called the most capable and upright of their fellow citizens because they would discern the good of the whole, the general will, rather than trying to advance the narrow partial interests of their constituencies. I'm far from the first scholar to argue that Rousseau was offering an updated secular version of a very old ideal, present in various forms in the Stoics, in Cicero, Augustine, and Calvin, it was the idea that true freedom, as well as civic responsibility, involves learning to channel the will toward the good. Individuals exercise their autonomy, not by indulging their appetites, but by restraining them. That, I contend, is why John Adams, good New England Congregationalist that he was, found Rousseau so appealing. Adams owned three con copies of the social contract, and before 1780, he enthusiastically recommended the book to his wife, Abigail, and to his friends. Now, he later changed his mind. After the terror had transformed the French Revolution, and after the United States had split into rival parties with Jefferson siding with France and Adams with Britain, Adams criticized everything French 
including Rousseau. But that reversal, which you can track if you follow Adams's marginalia in the books in his library, comes in a later edition of the social contract, one that he bought after the fall of Robespierre. In the 1770s and 1780s, Adams saw things very differently. He believed that the Massachusetts Constitution, which identified equality and the education of all citizens as necessary for identifying and advancing the common good, should be understood as Rousseau reduced to practice. Adams wrote in his preamble, it is a social compact by which the whole people covenants with each citizen and each citizen with the whole people so that all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good. Not a compact of the people with their government, as both Hobbes and Locke had it, but of the sovereign people with themselves and for the purpose of the common good. This Rousseauvian way of thinking persisted through the 1780s. After the new nation had established its independence and John Adams had been sent off to Europe as an emissary, the United States were struggling, and I use that plural deliberately because that was the formulation that was standard for decades. The United States were struggling to recover from the economic chaos that followed the war. Many Americans in the mid-1780s were uneasy. Would those state constitutions, almost all of them similar to the sketch that Adams had made in the late 1770s, survive the challenge of independence? Would the Articles of Confederation hold the nation together? Among those who wanted a stronger central government were Virginian James Madison, all of 36 years old in the spring of 1787, the Scottish-born attorney James Wilson of Pennsylvania, and that now familiar bastard, orphan, son of a whore, Alexander Hamilton. Some of those who feared that the new nation was coming apart managed to engineer what became the Constitutional Convention, which was an audacious gamble, as most of you know, those who gathered in Philadelphia did not have the authority to do what they did. Madison arrived at the convention intent on creating a new form of government. In the weeks before the convention opened, he wrote for himself a little essay that would serve as a kind of source book for the next couple of years. He drew on it for his speeches in Philadelphia, for the 29 essays he wrote for what we now know as the Federalist, and for his speeches at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. That essay, The Vices of the Political System of the United States, or Vices for short, gives us a look inside Madison's head as he was thinking about a new constitution. So in the next half hour, I want to take you on a little tour into some of Madison's central texts, not only his essay, Vices, but also some of his speeches and his contributions to the Federalist. I'll stress dimensions of his thought that have been overlooked by many tour guides who've taken visitors around Madison's world, dimensions that tie his ideas, like those of his friend and chief ally, James Wilson, to John Adams and to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, I can see a few of you already squirming in your seats. I can see a few eyebrows knitting up. Um, a few of you are singing to yourselves the closing line from the number that Miranda gives King George after he finds out that John Adams has been elected president. Good luck, uh, but stay with me. You'll have a chance to uh, voice your objections uh, when I'm finished. In an article that's going to become part of her forthcoming book, The Interbellum Constitution, Alison LaCroix offers an image of Madison that I think captures very well what was distinctive about him. Madison, she writes, is often portrayed as a theoretical scientist of politics, but he was also a practical mechanic, sleeves rolled up, tinkering in the works. For him, structure was not an arid set of design sketches, but a model of interlocking wheels, cogs, and pistons. The most pressing issue, as Madison saw it, was the debate over the nature of the union. Was it a nation with a shared set of interests or values? Or was it a collection of states that jealously guarded their borders and powers? Well, today I want to show you a Madison working to create something more than a collection of states with different ambitions. What he wanted was a nation with shared values beyond the narrow interests of its individual citizens. Madison had studied at the College of New Jersey, a still rather obscure institution later named Princeton, uh, 
it's part of your contract at the Harvard faculty that you have to poke fun at Yale and Princeton every chance you get, so I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. He studied under John Witherspoon, a Scottish-born minister and follower of the Scottish moral philosopher Francis Hutcheson. Madison understood the friction between individual impulse and conscience. He perceived the gap between immediate perceptions of self-interest and the dictates of what Hutcheson called rational benevolence. In Madison's essay, Vices, he laid out all the ways in which the people of the United States, like sinful human beings always and everywhere, were putting their own interests above the good of the whole. Some commentators, notably Jack Rakoff, attribute to Madison early versions of what we now call the problem of collective action and the problem of free riders. Madison was worried that some states were proving themselves unwilling to shoulder their share of the burdens of being part of a nation. Reading through vices, it's hard to see how Madison thought this experiment in self-government could be saved from chaos. In vices, he offered a shrewd and I think too seldom understood analysis of social conflict. All civilized societies, he wrote, are divided into different interests and factions. Madison listed seven such conflicts, including those between creditors or debtors, rich or poor, farmers, merchants, or mechanics, members of different religious sects, followers of different political leaders, inhabitants of different re regions, and owners of different kinds of properties. So Madison's understanding of conflict cannot be captured by a simple division between elites and the people. He had seen wealthy and prominent planters disgraced and rejected, as he was in the elections of 1777 and 1785, and as his friend Jefferson was at the end of his term as governor of Virginia. He had seen recent immigrants, such as Pennsylvania's Wilson and the New Yorker Hamilton, rise quickly from poverty and anonymity to become figures of wealth and power, and he would see them later become targets of public abuse. Madison understood that no single rift, whether of class or occupation or religion or region, captured all the complicated dimensions of human interaction. The key to Madison's solution to this problem lay in harnessing all these cross-cutting divisions and putting them to use. Through political institutions, he believed autonomous citizens could create a culture of democracy devoted to pursuing the common good. How would it work? Madison denied that majoritarianism would be enough he offered a familiar version of the observation that any group of three can yield a majority of two who decide to enslave the other one. Madison knew that different regimes had tried to meet these ancient objections to majority rule in different ways. Monarchies relied on the neutrality of the king. Small republics counted on limiting the power that government could use against its people. But history showed how frequently such measures had failed. Madison had a different idea, one that resembled those of Rousseau and Adams. He conceived of representative democracy as a process of continuing deliberation and experimental truth testing. He leveraged Aristotle's insight about the moderation of conditions in large states against Montesquieu's admonition that republics must remain small. In a large self-governing nation, Madison called for, in his words, such a process of elections as will most certainly extract from the mass of society the purest and noblest characters which it contains, such as will feel most strongly the proper motives to pursue the end of their appointment. The similarity between that formulation and Rousseau's is uncanny. Also like Rousseau, Madison stipulated the purpose that representatives should keep in mind. This is the issue that I think many, th many commentators of his, on his thought have missed. The goal of government for Madison was not merely to manage conflict or preserve order, as liberal pluralists and tough-minded realist political scientists have claimed ever since the 1950s. Instead, in Madison's words, justice is the end of government. It is the end of civil society. It ever has been and ever will be pursued until it is obtained or until liberty be lost in the pursuit. The advantage of a large over a small republic, Madison first argued in Vices and then explained in his speeches at the conventions and in the Federalist, 
depends precisely on those cross-cutting interests that he had identified. Given the myriad complexities of those conflicts, he judged it all but impossible that any single constellation of interests could form or mobilize a majority around any interest other than what he called the public interest. By the time Madison wrote Federalist 51, he had come up with his best formulation of this crucial point. In the extended republic of the United States, he wrote, and among the great variety of interests, parties, and sects which it embraces, a coalition of the majority of the whole society could seldom take place upon any other principles than those of justice and the general good. Justice and the general good. Madison envisioned a system that would do more than balance competing groups or play off factions against each other or allow for contests of naked self-interest. Instead, Madison remained, remained committed to an ideal he drew from Witherspoon and from Witherspoon's teacher, Francis Hutcheson. It was an ideal that resembled those of Rousseau and Adams, the ideal that individuals might, through the mechanisms of representative democracy, create laws that would treat all citizens with justice. Not content with the idea of politics as a bare-fisted brawl, a slugfest in which individuals compete by advancing their own narrow conceptions of self-interest, Madison was struggling in vices to find the words to express his alternative. In April of 1787, he had not yet come up with the metaphors of filters and sieves that would become clear to him as he participated in the Constitutional Convention. But he was already trying to explain how the democratic process of multiple elections, the deliberations of representatives, and the two-way communication between representatives and constituents might, through an endless series of apparently conflict-ridden arguments, bring into being the closest approximation of the common good that flawed human beings could create. Now, Madison experienced his share of defeats at the Constitutional Convention. That's among the reasons why scholars now rarely refer to him as the founder, as they used to do. The Constitution hardly conformed to his model. He opposed the idea that the Senate should represent states rather than population. He rejected that provision as undemocratic, as many of us do now, because it gave disproportionate power to the states with the smallest populations. Like his friend and chief ally, James Wilson, he preferred the direct election not only of congressmen and senators, but also of the president, a scandalous idea for most of the convention. Madison was ambivalent about slavery, which some de delegates condemned, but which Georgia and South Carolina refused to allow even to come to the convention floor for debate. Madison wanted the federal government to have a veto over state legislation, his uh, pet um, negative, as he called it, was just another idea of his that the convention rejected. But gradually, Madison reconciled himself to the compromises that were necessary to placate the small states and the slave states. When the Constitution was sent to the states for ratification, Madison pocketed his disappointments. He decided to defend the Constitution not as perfect, but as the best the delegates could do. One of the pivotal states, along with his own Virginia, was New York. Which, would be the seat of the which was the seat of the national government in 1787 and contained many anti-federalists who were opposed to the Constitution. So Madison borrowed some money, traveled directly from Philadelphia to New York, where the Congress was meeting, and agreed to cooperate with Hamilton to write the essays that we now know as the Federalists. Madison and Hamilton already knew how much they disagreed with each other. Hamilton spoke little in the opening days of the convention, in part because he was outnumbered in the New York delegation itself uh, by two opponents of the new national government. His views were idiosyncratic, which became apparent when he finally did speak. Miranda is right to observe that Hamilton spoke for six hours and proposed his own form of government. He was an outspoken opponent of democracy. He agreed with Madison and Wilson about uh, he, disagreed, excuse me, he disagreed with Madison and Wilson about popular elections. He wanted a Senate and a president who would serve for life. If Congress had to be elected by the people, he wanted it balanced by a lifelong, powerful executive and by a supreme judicial court whose judges would also serve for life. Hamilton's plan smacked of monarchy, and it attracted almost no support. So when Madison agreed to join forces with Hamilton and with John Jay in defense of the Constitution, he already knew that they disagreed about basic issues, including both the mechanics of government and its purpose. 
Of the Federalist essays, Madison's first contribution to the series, Federalist 10, has been enshrined as the classic statement of American political thinking. That's inaccurate for many reasons. First, Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay were writing as Publius. Nobody knew at the time who was the author of which essay. Second, their disagreements were profound. But in the Federalist, they were masked. It's important to know how Federalist 10 came into existence because it complicates the meaning that we attribute to it. In the essay, Madison developed arguments he had first sketched in Vices. He challenged Montesquieu and argued that self-government would work better in a large, heterogeneous nation than in a small city-state precisely because of the diversity of people and preferences. As every law student knows, in the final paragraph of 10, he described the Constitution as a Republican remedy for the diseases most incident to Republican government. But wait, just a few months before, in his opening speech before the Constitutional Convention, Madison had used a different terminology. In that speech, on June 6th, he had recommended framing a new Constitution that would be, in his words, the only defense against the inconveniences of democracy consistent with a democratic form of government, a democratic form of government. Throughout the convention, Madison and Wilson both argued for direct rather than indirect elections and for proportional representation in the Senate because those provisions were, as Madison put it, consistent with a democratic form of government. Wilson delivered the most widely rep reproduced and circulated speech in favor of ratifying the Constitution, read much more widely than the Federalist at the time, on October 6, 1787. He admitted that the Constitution was less democratic than he and some other delegates had wanted. It was imperfect, but the people could make it right because it could be amended. In this speech, Wilson echoed central arguments of Rousseau's social contract. Under the Constitution, the American people would not alienate their sovereignty, they would retain it and be able to exercise it, just as they had done during the struggle for independence and in the current debate over the Constitution. Their engagement showed their commitment to the common good, which Wilson distinguished from the sum of their individual preferences exactly as Rousseau distinguished the general will from the will of all. And the parallel is no accident. Rousseau, Wilson wrote his speeches with a copy of the social contract at his elbow, the same English translation that John Adams used when he was writing the Massachusetts Constitution. In a lengthy address six weeks later at the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, the parallels with Rousseau were even more apparent in Wilson's speech. Why do people leave the state of nature, Wilson asked. Although in that condition each individual can act according to what Wilson called the pleasure of his interest, their animosities eventually lead them, to drive, lead them to form the social compact. In joining together, each individual surrenders the liberty per previously enjoyed, but in Wilson's words, it is evident that he gains more by the limitations of the liberty of others than he loses by the limitation of his own. Wilson declared, that the aggregate of liberty is more in a society than it is in the state of nature because, precisely as Rousseau had argued, in a democracy, individuals are governed by laws they have made for themselves. Europeans, Wilson explained, still fail to understand the nature of representation. They still thought in terms of distinct social orders which played different roles in mixed governments. The entire American citizenry, by contrast, would vote to authorize the creation of the Constitution. When laws emanate from the people themselves through their elected representatives, and those laws embody the welfare of the whole, then individuals must obey, even if, Wilson might have added, they must be forced to be free. Those at the Constitutional Convention weighed the advantages and the disadvantages of various forms of government. In the end, they adopted a plan that Wilson characterized as purely democratical. All the streams of power in the plan could be traced, he concluded, to one great and noble source, the people. So Madison and Wilson agreed that the Constitution was democratical, to use Wilson's word, and that its purpose was to find the common good, or what Wilson called the welfare of the whole, his term for Rousseau's general will. Then why in Federalist 10 
Did Madison abandon the term democracy that he had used in the convention, the word that Wilson continued to use? I want to ask you to consider two possible explanations, which we can discuss when I conclude in a few minutes. The first explanation, which is the one I offer in Toward Democracy, is that Madison was ensnared by an old debater's trick. In Hamilton's Federalist 9, the essay published on November 21st, 1787, Hamilton characterized the Constitution with its reliance on representative government and the indirect election of both senators and the president as something categorically different from democracy. Picking up the formulation that Madison had used in his Vice's essay and at the convention about the need for a defense against the inconveniences of democracy consistent with the democratic form of government, Hamilton changed Madison's terminology. The institutional architecture of the Constitution, he wrote, provides the means by which the excellencies of republican government may be retained and its imperfections lessened or avoided. With that rhetorical sleight of hand, Hamilton distanced Publius and Federalists more generally from what Madison had called the democratic form of government, and he aligned the Constitution with what Hamilton called the excellencies of republican government. Hamilton's move was so shrewd that he convinced later commentators that the Constitution had somehow been transformed from Wilson's purely democratical framework into something else, namely a republic. Although the Constitution itself had not changed at all, critics ever since have treated it as though it somehow had metamorphosed into a different creature. Federalists like Madison and Wilson became elitists. Anti-Federalists became Democrats, which was even stranger as Saul Cornell showed in The Other Founders, his best, the best book, I think, on the Anti-Federalists, many Anti-Federalists defended existing arrangements in the states simply to preserve their own positions of authority, arrangements that were no more democratic than those established by the new Constitution. So when Madison contributed his first essay to the Federalists, the celebrated number 10, he inherited Hamilton's rhetorical strategy. Publius had now designated the Constitution Republican, and distinguished it from the regimes of direct rule in antiquity, regimes that had proved themselves susceptible to homegrown demagogues and foreign conquerors. Madison was boxed in. How did that happen? Well, Hamilton's home was located on Wall Street, appropriately enough, on the block between Pearl Street and William Street. Madison's lodgings with the Virginia delegation to Congress were located at 19 Maiden Lane. The distance between them is about a quarter of a mile. It takes about five minutes to walk. So Madison and Hamilton were in very close proximity to each other. They were able to confer on the essays as they were churning them out, nonstop, as Miranda has it. I can't help wondering what Madison said to Hamilton when he read Federalist 9, which established Publius as a critic of the very democratic principles that Madison and Wilson had defended at the Constitutional Convention against Hamilton. We'll never know. We'll never be in the room where that happened. But now Madison had no choice but to adopt Hamilton's distinction. In Federalist 10, published only one day after Federalist 9, Madison too designated as pure democracies, the regimes that Hamilton had described as unstable, those with, as he put it, a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person. Although it might be Obvious, it's worth emphasizing that no English colony, no state under the Articles of Confederation had ever operated in that way. All of them, even the smallest, had relied on representative assemblies ever since the early 17th century. No one in America in the 1760s through the 1780s, not Tom Paine, not any agrarian or urban radical, and certainly not any Federalist, had ever proposed such a pure democracy as a viable alternative for the United States. Hamilton was using one of the oldest rhetorical strategies in the book by creating two straw men and then locating Publius in the sensible moderate center. Madison was hardly in agreement with Hamilton about the Constitution. All of his writings and his speeches before the fall of 1787 showed that Madison, like Wilson, conceived of the Constitution as a democratic solution to a democratic problem. But in the Federalist, he had no choice but to adopt Hamilton's framework. Another common interpretation of Federalist 10 reflects a different but I think related misunderstanding. In perhaps the most familiar sentence in all of American political thought, Madison wrote, the latent causes of faction are sown in the nature of man. 
and we see them brought into different degrees of activity according to the different circumstances of civil society. Only by extinguishing liberty could the causes of faction be removed. And that cure, Madison thought, would be worse than the ill. As in vices, Madison observed that faction originates in what he called the diverse faculties of men from which the rights of property originate. Because Madison contended that the protection of these faculties is the first object of government, readers at both ends of the political spectrum have taken him to mean that defending property rights, not defending the faculties from which those rights originate, is the principal purpose of government. But that claim is made plausible only by selective quotation from the essay and by limited familiarity with Madison. As he did in Vices and elsewhere, he noted that there are multiple causes of faction, including not only property, but religion, disagreements over politics, local and regional traditions, and one cause that has special salience for us in 2019, the perennial and sometimes irrational attachments of people to their leaders. Well, since these multiple causes of faction cannot be removed, Madison argued that we have to work against the undesirable effects of faction. Governments have to find a way, in his words, to prevent legislators from serving as what he called advocates and parties to the causes they determine. Whatever the issue, indebtedness, domestic manufacturers, taxes, responsible government needs what Madison called the most exact impartiality. Yet there are always powerful temptations for legislators to choose their own or their constituents' immediate interest, to use Madison's term, over what they should be seeking, namely justice and the public good. For Madison, as for Adams and Wilson, faction did not represent a healthy sign of a vibrant culture, as some later pluralists and defenders of limit limited government have claimed. The causes of faction lay in the human propensity to sin, the inclination to favor one's own interest over the common interest. The solution required cultivating the human capacity for virtue. Madison has long been identified as the epitome of American liberal pluralism, but I think we should reconsider that judgment. Madison did not aim merely at stasis or moderation or stability. He did not just want to pit faction against faction, interest against interest, so that they could cancel each other out. He aimed a lot higher. He aimed at autonomy, equality, and justice, goals that he thought could be achieved through democratic government. The aim, in his words, was to secure the public good and private rights against the danger of factions, even a majority faction that was intent on pursuing its own interest against the common interest. Preserving what he called the spirit and form of popular government was the great object to which our inquiries are directed. Madison's goal remained the public good, an ideal that lay beyond the interests of any particular group of individuals. How could that be discovered? How could it be achieved? For Madison, the key to responsible self-government, whether in a republic or a democracy, whatever you called it, was deliberation. Representative institutions, in Madison's words, served to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may best discern the true interest of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. The result will be, as Madison put it, that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves convened for that purpose. When representatives deliberate, Madison argued, they have a better chance to find the common good, the public interest, the spirit beyond faction and beyond self-interest. That, of course, was what Rousseau called the general will, what Wilson called the welfare of the whole, and Adams called the common good. Knowledge of that common good could emerge, as it did for Madison and other delegates at the convention in Philadelphia only through the process of deliberation and compromise and creative rethinking. That was why in Federalist 55, Madison wrote that even if every Athenian had been a Socrates, every assembly of the whole citizenry would have been a mob. When there's no possibility of deliberation, no give and take of arguments, but only the choice of voting up or down 
yes or no, popular decision making is fatally flawed. That's why plebiscites are problematical, and that's why Madison, like Rousseau, Adams, and Wilson, thought that members of representative assemblies should aim to do more than simply mirror the self-interested preferences of their constituents. Threats to the common good came from multiple sources. Madison followed his mentor Witherspoon in believing that the dangers of passion and self-interest are ubiquitous in politics and in the moral decisions that confront every individual. 18th century Scottish philosophers emphasized the capacity of individuals to harness their unruly selves through the disciplined cultivation of conscience to accord with the dictates of benevolence. Madison, too, believed that the institutions of representative democracy might enable Americans, through their chosen representatives, to identify and defeat schemes running contrary to the common good. Achieving that goal for individuals as for political institutions requires that reason constrain impulse. Decades ago, the German historian Willie Paul Adams showed that in the state constitutional conventions, the words democracy and republic were used interchangeably. But in the 1960s, the academic mania for classical republican theory led to its being found everywhere. And then the false binary of Republican versus liberal fed into prevailing characterizations of the Federalist as a sacred text, even the founding text of American liberalism. That dynamic has caused us to misunderstand what happened in Philadelphia and in the debates that followed. In the Constitution, Madison now proclaimed in Federalist 10, we behold a Republican remedy for the diseases most incident to Republican government. With a stroke of his quill, Madison reproduced Hamilton's magic trick. Beneath the smoke and mirrors, though, and despite his torching of the straw man of pure democracy that no one in America preferred to representative democracy, Madison's commitments to individual liberty, popular sovereignty, and the common good remained intact. He was still defending exactly the same framework that his chief ally, Wilson, had accurately described as purely democratical because there was no source of authority anywhere in the system other than the will of the people. Okay, so that's the first explanation of the discrepancy between the use of democracy in the June 6 speech and the later use of republic in Federalist 10. The alternative explanation is prompted by Mary Sarah Builder's recent book, Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention, which was published in 2015, just after I had sent the manuscript of Toward Democracy to Oxford University Press. Madison's notes on the Federal Convention has long been considered the most authoritative source for the debates in Philadelphia during the spring and summer of 1787. Even though the notes were published after Madison's death in 1836, most scholars have relied on it as a more or less accurate account of what went on in the Convention. That's how I treat it in Toward Democracy. But Builder argues that Madison altered the record in significant respects when he revised the notes, first in the late 1780s and then when he returned to the project much later. She argues in particular that Madison revised the speech that he dated June 6th in the notes and that he inserted into that speech parts of an earlier speech that he had given in June 4th, which he doesn't record. This is intriguing because it's in that June 6th speech that he used the words, the inconveniences of democracy consistent with the democratic form of government. Builder discovered that Madison used different paper to insert that June speech into the manuscript that became the notes. She contends that he wrote the speech dated June 6th much later, possibly as much as two years later, between the fall of 1789 and the spring of 1790. That would mean he wrote the speech after he had written Federalist 10 and after he had written all of his contributions to the Federalist. Now, if that is true, we cannot know what Madison said, if anything, about a democracy or a republic in his opening speech about the Virginia plan at the convention itself. If Builder is right, we can know only that whenever he rewrote that speech, if indeed he, re did, re if indeed he did rewrite it for the notes, he was no longer satisfied with the formulation in Federalist 9 or Federalist 10. They simply didn't accord with the way he now thought about the Constitution. 
If he did rewrite the speech at a later date, he evidently rewrote it to highlight his commitment to a democratic form of government and to distance himself very decisively from Hamilton. If Builder is right about the timing, Madison would have rewritten the June 6th speech when he was working on two projects. He was drafting the First Amendments to the Constitution and he was mobilizing opposition to Treasury Secretary Hamilton's plan to fund state debts. The tensions between Madison and Hamilton, which were apparent in the Constitutional Convention but muted in the Federalist, were coming into the open again, as they would do for the rest of Madison's life. Okay, so which of these two explanations makes more sense to you? Did Madison abandon his phrase, a democratic frame of government, and adopt Hamilton's framework in Federalist 10 because he had no choice in light of Federalist 9? Or did he later see the importance of identifying the aim of the delegates of the convention as a democratic form of government once he realized that Hamilton and his New York cronies had a, something in mind very different from what Madison and Wilson and Jefferson wanted? Well, I look forward to discussing these questions with you in just a minute, but first let me conclude. In either case, this quick look at Adams, Wilson, and Madison shows that they agreed on a fundamental proposition that I think deserves more attention. The forms of government established in the United States from 1776 through 1787 were, in Wilson's words, purely democratical because there was no source of power anywhere in any of the institutions other than the will of the people. There was no monarch. There was no aristocracy. There were no inherited privileges. There was nothing but the citizenry. The distinction Hamilton drew between a republic and a democracy was nothing more than a debater's trick, and we should stop seeing it as an important categorical distinction. The historian Jonathan Ganap, in his new book, The Second Creation, shows that treating the Constitution as a text with a fixed meaning is a mistake. He makes clear that its meaning was indeterminate, deliberately indeterminate, as both Madison and Wilson insisted during the debates over ratification. Its meaning had to be established in practice over time through trial and error. The meanings that developed from those practices were not inherent in the text, nor were they necessary or inevitable. They were the contingent products of particular historical controversies and choices that individuals, individuals made. We'll have an even clearer sense of how that happened when Alison LaCroix completes the interbellum constitution. Even so, Gnapp concludes, none of us can avoid treating the Constitution as a foundational text. Even historians certain that it has no singular original meaning, and that includes me, have to make arguments about why we think it is open-ended, why we think it is living rather than fixed or determinate. Our argument also turns on how we interpret texts left by those who created the Constitution. I think Gnapp's right about that. That's just what I've tried to do today. In 45 minutes, I've tried to show you how we should understand Rousseau and Adams and show you why that understanding should change the way we see Madison and Wilson. It took me hundreds of pages to do that in Toward Democracy, so you got the streamlined version in just under an hour. And here in conclusion is the point that I would like for you to consider. The purpose of representation in Adams, Wilson, and Madison's understanding of it was to facilitate deliberation not just horse trading. Their goal was not merely or even primarily to defend individual rights, let alone the right to property. Their goal was Rousseau's goal, to find a way to advance the welfare of the public, the common good. So if you've been thinking about the Constitution as a charter securing individual rights or protecting particular interests against the government, or as a bulwark against institutions designed to advance the welfare of the public as a whole, and as a defense of individual self-interest, I want to urge you to think again. The Constitution is, above all, concerned with the search for the common good, and that is why Madison matters. You've all been very 
quiet in listening to me tell you everything you know is wrong. So now tell me why I'm wrong. Questions, comments, objections? Richard. Um, I have a following question, which is exactly how it is that we determine the common good if we don't treat it in some sense as some of aggregate individual interests. Let me say what I think the problem is. Uh, traditional sort of classical liberal theorem is kind of different line says, well, we don't have a common good, but if we can find one state of the world in which every individual is at least as well off better than in another state of the world, we will say that the common good to some extent has been achieved. Uh, you explicitly direct, rejected in the course of your lecture uh, that sort of summation of methodological individualism. What I don't understand is when you now get a piece of legislation and you have to decide whether it is or is not something, if parade of superiority or some variant on that doesn't do it, how we, when we deliberate, actually know whether or not we've achieved or not achieved a particular standard. Well, I think this is one of the differences between a uh, culture in which assumptions about psychological egoism, which are the assumptions that undergird the tradition you're talking about, uh, are now taken for granted rather than... Well, even if we reject that, then I think we place our emphasis on the capacity of individuals to see beyond their self-interest to something that is broader than their self-interest. So it's not additive, it's not summative. It's, a, as I said, a very old conception of the difference between your momentary uh, perception of your self-interest and something beyond that. The only way it can happen is through the deliberation of elected representatives. Now, we now think of elected representatives as doing nothing other than advancing the interests, the narrow interests of their constituencies. That's my point, is that's not the model that at Madison or Wilson was working with. More concrete. 1790 you passed the Pact Act, you passed the Copyright Act, right? And both of these are obviously to some extent designed to deal with the common good. How do you know whether or not they've done a good job or a bad job of achieving it? And I don't, I, I'm not trying to defend the psychological egotism, I think it's much more complicated. But suppose we have functions that are really very complicated and independent utilities and so forth. We still have to answer the question, this bill is now coming out. Why do we vote for it? Why do we go against it? What amendments do we put forward and why? And there's a huge amount of legislation that went through in this first Congress. And so the question still is, given your assumptions, rejecting the individualist motive, uh, you have to figure out, do I vote for or against this after the deliberation is over? How right. do you I would simply be restating what I've already said in response to that. I mean, one of the reasons why Ganap's book is so interesting and that Allison's book is going to be so interesting, I think, is that they show the ways in which people actually did reason to come to those conclusions. And it happens fairly quickly that people begin placing much more emphasis on what they perceive to be the interests of their constituents than on what they would call Republican virtue. So I don't dispute that those become very central very quickly, but we'd have to go through individual pieces of legislation, individual court cases, and that's what this rising generation of, of scholars is doing in their uh, accounts of how the uh, 1790s unfold. So I think the fundamental difference between your perception and mine um, is that I really see Madison and Wilson in particular looking at the world in a very different way from the way that we have conventionally looked at it and the way that I know from reading some of your work that you see it. Okay, fair enough. Martha? Yeah, I wanted to ask about this stuff. I actually happen to be teaching me a new oh, good. day in this very room. Um, you <laughs> mentioned that the problem is with the bodily evidence, but I mean, Rousseau says uh, 10 different things on every topic, <laughs> but I mean, certainly the Stoics do not think that. And Rousseau certainly, according to a certain strand in Rousseau scholarship represented by John Rawls's his, uh, lectures on the history of ethics, Josh Cohen, uh, and so on, does not think that either. He's much closer to Kant in thinking the real problem is the inflamed amour propre that comes from a situation of social inequality where you have competition for scarce right. resources. Now, if we think that Madison, I mean, I think that fits much better with your interpretation of Madison in many ways, but it does look like Rawls is correct to think that if you focus on that as the main problem, you'll want also to mitigate material inequality. And that's something Madison talks about here and there. Yeah. But, he doesn't, but it's really Tom Paine who makes much more of that besides the Stoics. And Madison kind of likes to that drop in the Constitution. Well, no, no, yeah. Social and economic rights, although some of the state constitutions 
do have that. Right, right. Well, I think what, um, I mean, Madison doesn't refer enough to Rousseau directly for us to know right. what he makes of Rousseau. He only refers to him briefly later. But what I think both Wilson and John Adams saw in Rousseau was an argument about the way in which a competition would lead individuals to value themselves in relation to those meaningless accoutrements of, of property that the tutor works so hard to get Emile to see as less important yeah. than his, the quality of his character. Um, whether we tie that to the Stoics or not, I mean, there's a reason why Kant is so moved by Rousseau, right? I mean, he, he sees the resonances between Rousseau's ideas and those that he's developing. And I do think that it's just a different conception of what it is to be a fully realized human being. And John Adams is quite explicit, as is, in some cases, Jefferson, more than Madison is, about the absolutely essential nature of economic equality for a democracy. That if everyone is going to feel as though they have a stake in this, the gaps that they saw when they went to Europe, Franklin, Jefferson, uh, Adams in particular, the gaps that they saw between the landed nobility and ordinary people simply could not be allowed to occur in the United States or else the democracy would fall apart. So Jefferson lays out a plan by which anyone who doesn't have property, any white man who doesn't have property, will be given 50 acres of property. And he envisioned Virginia as stretching clear across North America to uh, the Pacific Ocean. And so for time, you know, he couldn't imagine a thousand years in which there would be not enough, in, in which we'd run out of land. And without that kind of stake and that kind of rough equality, he thought self-government was going to be very, very difficult. And I think Madison agreed with him about that. And I think the reason was that they thought the autonomous citizen, the citizen who's not dependent on someone else, is the fundamental building block of self-government. So I don't disagree with anything you said. Um, I had hoped to do more with the German states in the book than I did because I wanted to write more about Kant. But it turns out that there's not a whole lot of self-rule in the German states uh, and, <laughs> until 1919, briefly, and then after 45, um, planted with a sharp end of a bayonet, one could say. OK. Please. So I want to comment Richard's kind of good question in the opposite direction. You said originally that the question was debunking, but another move that conservatives are making on today and is to invoke a thick, unchanging notion of the common good rooted in natural law. And I'm wondering what your researches would say uh, about that in this connection. Because you, you, you align between general will and common good, uh, common good as a thick term of art uh, suggests that, the liber that there, you know, there's a difference between, quote, on this kind of if you are a uh, Roman uh, guardianship committee and quote on this tangent if you're uh, medieval monks because you discuss and you approve stuff and presumably the spirit comes in and right. uh, reason comes in and fixes what it is you meant to stop. Now, one of the striking things to me about the difference between this generation of American thinkers um, and many who had preceded them in the tradition of classical Republican is their conception of time. Because I think one could counterpose to Republican cyclical time a democratic conception of open-ended time. And I don't think they see a fixed, unchanging natural law governing a democracy. I think they see problem solving as the work of a democracy, addressing individual problems, individual challenges as they emerge. And so the reason why I think both Wilson and Madison focused on the indeterminate nature of the Constitution as much as they did is that they wanted it to be, as, as Allison puts it, um, legislators with their sleeves rolled up, working it out, trying to solve problems, finding out what works, what are the consequences of this step, what are the consequences of that step that we need to rethink it. And that's a very different conception from classical or medieval views of, of natural law. So I think that this attempt to turn the founders into 
early modern thinkers or medieval thinkers is simply historically inaccurate. That they were much more closely attuned, and this will make historians cringe, with a sort of proto-pragmatist sensibility, a problem-solving sensibility. And so the, the fact that the Constitution is amendable is really fascinating in the contrast it has to the French constitutions, which are assumed by the philosophe to be the product of reason. And when it's reason with a capital R that's generating your constitution, you don't need to change it. You've got it right. And Madison, Wilson never thought they had it right. I mean, Madison defends it in those letters to Jefferson. We try to convince him we don't need a Bill of Rights. He thinks it's unnecessary. He thinks it's incoherent for the people to need to defend themselves against themselves. But when he sees that politically it's necessary, he's willing to go along with it and to say this is going to be the case going forward. We're going to have to make changes because we don't know how the people are going to decide. So I think there's a very different conception that doesn't align them with natural law, but instead with this new conception of government responding to the people. Is that adequate? I like it. Okay, all right. I do too. I do too. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, why Madison matters, um, the way in which historians have answered that has changed a lot over the last, say, 100 years. Um, when Charles Beard uh, picked up Federalist 10, he was amazed. He thought it looked like Marx. Yep. Um, and I think he's largely responsible for us reading that essay at, you know, for most of the 20th century. Um, William Krosky, who taught at this law school and who had advanced a kind of similar uh, theory to, to builders, but with no evidence. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, saw Madison as an obstacle uh, to New Deal legislation, um, a kind of anti-hero. Anti uh, Bernard Balin and, and, and Gordon Wood um, saw a very Sydney version of, of uh, um, Madison, and you are now giving us a Rousseau Democratic. <laughs> Um, do you want to reflect a little bit on just the malleability of Madison um, and, and answers to that question over the last century? Well, my own feeling is that we can't do other than be presentist in our scholarship. That the notion of a, a, a purely neutral Olympian detachment that historians uh, assume when they write is a fantasy that we're engaged in what I call pragmatic hermeneutics. There's a range of interpretations that are available within the parameters of the evidence. And we can't put words in Madison's mouth. I mean, one of the striking things about Mary Builder's um, book is that she's taking words out of Madison's mouth, right? And they're, they're reinserting them in another way. We can't create texts for him that aren't there. But I think we shouldn't also deny the full amplitude of the texts that he gave us. And it does seem to me more in political science than in history, but even among historians, that people do tend to pick and choose among his texts in order to fit him into whichever conception of the American project they have in mind. And my conception of the American project is that it is a democracy. And that we on the left have made a terrible strategic error for decades in demonizing the founders. That if we read them as Democrats, we can see that they put the onus on us to bring this democracy to fruition. They didn't create it so that it's fully formed and all it has to do is unfold. They made it possible for the people to take control of it. And I think that the whole liberal versus Republican debate was misconceived from the beginning. I want to change the conversation. I want to go back to democracy. I want to go back to the argument that I think was present from the early 17th century on in New England, that self-rule places the responsibility on ordinary people through the political processes to choose the kind of nation they want to have, the kind of town they want to have, the kind of colony, then the kind of state, and now the kind of nation that we want to have. So there is a lot in Madison that can be read in different ways. What I'm offering is a new reading because I really do think that we should stop treating the founders as having given us this oligarchy that we have to struggle against as though somehow the powerful and the wealthy are privileged by the founders and the rest of us are excluded. I don't see it that way. 
I see all of us as being invited into this democratic project by Madison, by James Wilson, and it's now up to us to accept that invitation and take the responsibility to make the nation into what we would like for it to be. Well, unfortunately, I have to be presentist at the moment because we're out of time. All right. So please join me and thank you.